If you're listening to this on YouTube, this episode is one week delayed. Up-to-date Tech Show But Friendly episodes are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. This is Tech Show But Friendly, Hardware Sugar's podcast with your host Anton. And let's jump right into it, saying goodbye to a very famous and very likable tech YouTuber. Unfortunately, I think last week or so, but very recently, the tech YouTuber known as Bitwit, aka Kyle, aka Lyle, announced that he would be stepping back from creating tech content to focus on his more lifestyle. He has a secondary channel which he started relatively recently compared to his main tech channel, Bitwit. But he'll be focusing on that channel, on Workhorse for now. The content of Workhorse seems a lot um, broader than his usual fare on Bitwit. So less tech-related, more gaming-related, more vlogging style, like what he's doing. And uh, Kyle has always been a funny guy, very down-to-earth. I think that's, that's, a part, that's a large part of his appeal for his audience where he does seem very relatable. So a channel mainly focused on him, and sorry, I believe he changed Workhorse, the title of his secondary channel, to act- to his real name. So I think it's Kyle Hansen or something like that. Again, to realign the brand to revolve around him. And I don't mean that like in a very conceited or self-centered way. Just the fact that his content will be focused on basically what he's doing rather than a particular topic such as tech. Bitwit is one of the most recognizable names for tech YouTubers, right up there with LTT, Gamers Nexus, Pulse Hardware. I mean, those are sort of the top tier tech guys that are always kind of hanging out with each other and messaging each other, mentioning each other on their channels. So, but he, aside from so he is part of that club but aside from being part of that club he got there on the back of a very likable personality so not afraid to can take a bit risky comedic slant with as with Lyle to be honest the Lyle character I'm always surprised there wasn't like a backlash because it it seems like everything that might even be slightly offensive now gets a backlash. Although the Lyle character was retired a while back, so maybe you know the the current thinking wasn't around yet when the Lyle character was out. But it seemed like the very stereotypical Chinese individual or Asian, st- very stick in the mud kind of Asian way of basically a prig, <laughs> yung kind of stick up his ass, kind of no sense of humor. Which is the whole point of why the character Lyle was so funny. But yeah, so the the Kyle's humor certainly pervasive or permeating his entire channel. Even though tech can be a bit dry. So actually, that was a very refreshing take on the whole tech YouTuber approach. Sad to see him go, as personally, I was a fan. I enjoyed his comedic slant, as well as his in-depth tech coverage. He was sort of like us in the sense that, you know, specs were important, but they were the end-all and be-all. And he was a self-taught tech guy. So, yeah, that kind of content, especially now with a lot of the tech YouTubers kind of outracing themselves to prove that they're the techiest, the most specs-oriented, the most conversant in the most archaic of naming systems and in-depth coverage of the nitty-gritty of hardware. I mean, there's a place for that. Certainly, people can learn a lot from that. But there's also a place for more mainstream fare where we kind of don't forget that this is a hobby that's supposed to be fun instead of like a quiz or a lesson in school that we need to memorize the stats and the references and Oh, if you don't know that, then you're not a real PC guy and things like that. So I will miss the uh, bitwit approach to tech YouTube reporting. The YouTube tech channel, of course, very associated with that hard, hard, hardcore tech reporting is Gamers Nexus. And they came out with another banger of a video or sensational coverage this past week when they delved into the specifics of why 
the 7000 series CPUs of AMD have been burning up. Like, they literally get so hot that they sometimes bulge out of the motherboard or out of the frame that they're in. So this latest controversy of a brand new tech component burning up from too much heat and too much voltage has been mostly focused around the X3D versions of the 7000 series. Although AMD's latest statement regarding the solutions to the problem doesn't specify that it's the problem or the concern is only limited to X3D CPUs. So the commentary online seems to be that any 7000 series CPU might be affected, not just the X3D. There have been scattered reports of the same thing happening to 7000 series non-X3D. But the focus of the attention has been on the X3D, specifically the 7800X3D, just because it seemed like such a nice chip for gaming. I mean, performance-wise, it seemed it had the optimal performance for gaming in particular. Uh, but yun, unfortunately, we there have been users reporting the the news first came out on Reddit where a, a poster. You know, showed a picture of like, yeah, you know, I just basically got home. My brand new 7800X3D <laughs> chip seems to have burned itself out on the motherboard and Gamers Nexus got involved, eventually tracing the problem to too much voltage. So there's just too much juice. The motherboard forced too much juice into the CPU. This is an abbreviated, less techy version, less hardcore version since this is tech show but friendly. But basically, the motherboard sent too much juice to the CPU and it fried it. Now this can happen due to user error or an overzealous user can set the SOC voltage beyond 1.3 volts. So the current number to remember is 1.3. You don't want to go over 1.3 volts for your SOC voltage. But even if you're a user that never monkeys around with the BIOS, this can still happen to you as depending on your motherboard manufacturer, depending on your BIOS version, sometimes the motherboard will pump in more than 1.3 volts to the SOC. And it's doing this because it's trying to implement an overclock XMP or Expo setting. Now, the findings have been very clear that Expo or XMP is not the problem. There's no inherent danger in enabling XMP or Expo. It's just that because the BIOS is trying to carry out that instruction as a side effect of that, it pumps in or tries to pump in more voltage to the SOC beyond the recommended 1.3 volts. But as a practical solution, what to do now, AMD has released new instructions to motherboard manufacturers and in turn, the motherboard manufacturers have released new BIOS. Basically, just update your BIOS. Per GN's video, this isn't, you know, just focusing on the SOC voltage is a stopgap measure. Like, they identified further problems in the architecture and how things get done with the AM5 platform. But even the Gamers Nexus video says that this is a rare problem, so it's not like every other 7000 series CPU is going up in smoke. While it is a reproducible problem because they were able to burn up a CPU intentionally or by design, again, this is not something that predominantly happens. It is a rare occurrence. And with the latest advice from AMD to update your BIOS and with a lot of the BIOS with a lot of the motherboard manufacturers issuing new BIOSes. That should be a reasonably effective measure to ensure that your motherboard doesn't burn up your CPU in its zealous quest to get faster speeds. I mean, that's basically why it's pumping more voltage, more juice into your CPU. It's trying to make it run faster. And the dismaying thing about this was, I mean, these are... Quite expensive new parts, right? The 7800X3D just came out. And then the user in particular who posted on Reddit had a ROG X670E motherboard. Also not cheap by any means. We have one currently in the shop that we're planning to use for a build. And just 
Although the one, the CPU that we have in the shop is the 7950X3D, so the top, top, top of the line. And just those two components, the CPU and the motherboard, are just shy of 100K pesos. So, you know, these are expensive components. And I think that's what's shaken up the PC world a bit that, you know, you're you're supposed to be buying quality, especially when you when it comes to motherboards. As you go higher and higher in the on in the tier structure and the pricing, they put so many doodads or you know additional features into the motherboards, so many additional protections. You, as a consumer, you kind of think that these kind of things shouldn't happen anymore with all of the fancy AI and other features built into especially more premium products, but. It does happen. More growing pains for the AM5 platform. Very reminiscent of... I mean, it's not like every major launch of a PC component we've had now has had some issue of basically having too much juice of something melting or blowing up or burning up. Of course, the 40 series of NVIDIA. AMD's troubles also with the 7000 series GPUs. And now the AM5 CPUs. So always good to keep abreast of the latest news. If you don't like religiously follow the hardware news, don't worry about it. Just follow Tech Show But Friendly every week. And we usually report on things like this. And more importantly, perhaps for our customers in the shop, we do try to keep ourselves up to date and aware so that we know the potential problems we might encounter when we're assembling your computers when we're ensuring that the rigs that we assemble are A, safe, B, efficient, and C, good value for money. I mean, what's the point of buying these expensive things when they're just going to melt down on you, right? And um, I'm quite proud that with that policy, we haven't had, knock on wood, any of the concerns that we've reported on. So like, for example, we haven't had any 40 series card, especially the earlier ones that we did, like the 4090s. None of those guys ever burnt up, even when we were using the adapter. And it's kind of interesting just to look at it from an outsider's perspective. There's like a mass hysteria. Every time somebody reports that, oh, my, my component burned up, my GPU burned up, and it's like, Turuan Kagad, it's like a Spider Man meme where the brand is blaming the manufacturer, the manufacturer is blaming the user, and you know. It, it can quickly become a mess. And it's just unfortunate that lately, with all of the new stuff coming out, it, it, it's no major product launch <laughs> has escaped a part spontaneously combusting. I don't know if it's because, you know, our modern components, we don't appreciate just how much juice and how much heat, how much electricity we're using up and how much just we're really on the line of you were towing the line between awesome performance and catastrophic performance. So it's been interesting. I mean, I don't have an AM5 CPU. I don't have a 40 series GPU. So it's just been interesting from an outsider's perspective to be looking at these very new components and seeing the growing pains. Uh, I'm sure if you're a user of any of these products, it's less an academic exercise in taking a look in what could go wrong and rather a really palpable, realistic concern. And again, that's why we do try to keep up to, for our further education, but also for the benefit of our customers. Usually the point of all this fancy hardware is to play games, but you can still have the best, like literally top of the line hardware in the world but if the game is unoptimized, it won't run any better. Case in point is the recently released Jedi Survivor, a sequel to... I forget what the first game was called. Although I did play that. I'm a big Star Wars fan. I did play it. Um, Jedi Outcast, I think. And it Jedi Survivor is the continuation of that story. I enjoyed Outcast. I will be playing Survivor, but not just yet. I'll explain in a little bit. But Jedi Survivor came out to pretty positive reviews, especially on the consoles. But everybody, especially the PC guys, were up in arms on the port, on the version that we got on the PC. Because there were a lot of graphic issues reported. And when people dived into it, you could have a 4090 and you could still have stuttering. 
and they were taking, you know, users were taking a look at the GPU usage. At most, it was only coming around to like 30, 35%. So the game was so ill optimized, so unoptimized, that it wasn't even using the graphics card to 50% of the graphics card's potential. And this really highlights something that I wish more people appreciated that it's not just about the hardware. The software can even be more important than what hardware you're running. Kaya minsan may nagtatanong sa amin, oh, you know, I want to play this game at these specs, this frames per second. What hardware do I need? Or I, I just want to play these kind of games at 2K, 100 FPS. What hardware do I need? And I always find it very difficult to give specific hardware because that's always a moving target. The game's optimization, the game's performance can change on the settings that you have and also the patches that come out after the game has been released. Game patches and driver patches for whatever GPU you're using. So it's... I, Digital Foundry had an excellent review of Jedi Survivor and around the 7 minute 30 second mark, they have a statement where like, it's never, it's not a realistic option to just be presented with a laundry list of hardware and expect any game to run at X settings. Yeah, it's really a case-to-case -case basis. Also because there are so many possible permutations of computer hardware, possible permutations of the settings even in-game. So it always drives me kind of nuts when we get those kind of inquiries na yung gusto ko lang ganito. Parang Warzone at 60 FPS at 2K. And what do I need? And it, it sounds simple, but it's, you know, the tendency for the shop is to kind of provide a more or a slightly higher end build than probably what's needed just to make sure that it can really cover the wants of the customer. And so it's not an ideal situation for us because it's, you know, there's so many games on the market, there's so many hardware components, hardware brands on the market that, you know, there's, there's so many variables and permutations that it's really difficult to come up with. Yes, we can tell you 100% sure that this game will run it at these settings because you have this hardware. I mean, outside of putting it together muna before the customer pays for everything and then, and then trying it out. And then even then, yun nga, it's a moving target it, which can be improved or performance can decrease depending on the drivers and depending on the game patches. And Jedi Survivor is just a terrible example of that, that you can have the best hardware, but if the software optimization sucks, you're going to have a very or you're going to have a subpar experience. I mean, you have a 4090, you don't expect any stuttering of any kind, and yet, apparently, the shade, like, not to get too in-depth, but the shader loading wasn't optimized. So regardless of what card you have, there's going to be some stuttering or some slowdown as certain graphics are being rendered. But to go back to what I said earlier, I am a big fan of Star Wars. I was a big fan of Outcast, but I won't be playing Survivor yet. Because I realized, first of all, this is not the first time this happened. The same problems were reported in Outcast. Everybody was like, what the hell? What the hell? And yeah, I mean, game developers can rush out, do rush out, especially these console ports. Because, you know, everybody, all the versions have to release at the same time. It was probably developed natively for the console. And then the PC version was just an afterthought. You can definitely see that in Outcast where the UI, the menu, is geared towards a console controller rather than the kind of controls or just the interface that you would expect from a computer game, a native computer game. And I don't mind because I won't be paying full price for Survivor. One thing that really ticked me off when I bought Outcast, yeah, you know, I, I was in between games. I was ready for a new game. It came out. So I bought it full price. But then the Christmas of that year, you know, it, it had like a big discount on Steam or an Epic. And I think that was the last game what I, which I really bought at full price. Because I thought, you know, I can wait for it. And especially now with Survivor coming out with so many bugs, so many 
performance related issues and they're only starting to address that now i can definitely wait for the price to go down and for the performance to be optimized in fact the price has already gone down for the console versions of the game amazon is reportedly offering a 10 dollar discount on the console versions i won't be playing this on console but when come around Christmas time, definitely if the price is right on Steam or on Epic, I'll be snagging myself a copy. And that's really an underlooked great feature of PC games. You can just wait them out. And it doesn't take that long. I mean, less than a year. Let's just see. I think it's around $70 now for the full price, um, launch price. Let's just see what it is, you know, at the end of the year with all the Steam sales and things like that. And, you know, you have so many games left waiting anyway in your Steam queue, at least I do, that it, there's really no rush to get the latest AAA game, at least for me, where I, I'm usually a more single-player kind of guy, so I don't buy these multiplayer titles that, you know, you come out and you want to play right away. Probably the only game I can think of off the top of my head where I would buy it at launch date for the full price would be the upcoming Mass Effect. But even then, I might be tempted to wait. Depende. Depende what I'm doing, how much time I have when that game actually comes out. If it ever comes out. And we'll round out today's show with an update from Canada, which recently passed a law providing one of their government agencies with oversight over streaming services, requiring streaming services to pay a certain amount of money for the advancement of Canadian shows or supporting local, i.e. Canadian talents and shows and productions and whatnot, as well as promoting Canadian culture shows in general. And this doesn't seem relevant to us, but I'm always fascinated by these kind of local laws. I mean, laws passed by individual countries which affect international services. It's an easy move by any government to start passing laws on Facebook. You had the Australian parliament, I think a couple of years ago, threatening to charge Facebook. It, it was a news thing and they wanted Facebook to pay newspapers or other journalistic outlets. Basically, like if you're, if you're a, a journalist and you publish something, and then on Facebook, the link is there, but they read in Facebook rather than going to your page. The Australian government wanted Facebook to pay, or it was something something along those lines. And it's a bit similar here with the Canadian law, where the government is trying to flex its muscle and bring these international services in line. Just as a lawyer, it's pretty interesting to see the development of national laws trying to cope with transnational actors. And certainly there have been many, many corporations in the past that have been transnational, that do operate in many, many jurisdictions, but nothing quite as pervasive as streaming. So the internet is all-encompassing. It's an octopus that has you know, its tentacles all around the world. And the content that passes through that is so accessible anywhere. So, so I, I always fear these kind of laws it might have a chilling effect where it makes it harder for the provider. So if it's Netflix or the service rather, the Netflix, Spotify, all of these guys to operate in a particular country, then they might just say to heck with that country. And that's where the fragmentation of the internet begins. I mean, Metcalf's law, right? Um, a network is... is only as valuable... Sorry, I'm paraphrasing. I don't remember the exact... Uh, formulation of Metcalf's law. But basically, the network gains its strength from the number of connections in the network. And there's like an exponential effect to that. And that's, that's what I'm always afraid for our internet now. It gains its power because anywhere in the world, you can log on and you can, if you go to www.philippineairlines.com, for example, and you can buy a ticket from Philippine Airlines because everybody's on literally the same network. But if you start balkanizing the internet on in terms of speed, in terms of content, then that interoperability might be lost. And that's that's the beauty. Like that's the fundamental bedrock of the internet is that everything can talk to each other. TCP IP 
is the lingua franca of all of these computers on the network. And that's what makes it so powerful because each individual computer, whether user or server, adds to the value of the network. And you, if you start pruning these connections, like, you know, it's like, or oh, streaming services, because, you know, you're so bandwidth intensive and it's not fair to the other guys, we're going to charge you more. Or we're going to have certain rules applied to you compared to other services. I mean, you know, when you start distinguishing like that, I, I always fear that it's an attack on, or, or the unintended effect is a diminution of the public internet, which we all enjoy. I mean, you know, for its many, many shortcomings, most of which can be traced to the users, i.e. us, i.e. foolish humans who get toxic and upset and like flaming people. I mean, you know, it's in our nature to be social, but on the internet, it's in our nature to be social in an antisocial way sometimes, unfortunately, for a lot of us. But for all the ills of the internet, it's an amazing thing if you think about it. I mean, I grew up initially, like when I was born, there was no internet yet. So, I mean, having grown up with it from scratch as, you know, it started out with the dial-up days and the different services that have now come along and taken advantage precisely of that fact that it can reach so many people. It's, it's an amazing thing. And I, I wish that... And the problem with politicians who try to impose these laws, these vague... Uh, there are some concerns that the Canadian law is overbroad and vague, meaning I don't know how to... Comp I, I'm not sure whether my actions would violate the law so that's the vague part. And broad, meaning that the regulator has a lot of power to impose its judgment on these streaming services. And I do fear that these kind of laws are made by people who don't understand the internet, who don't appreciate the, the magic that makes it run. They just think, you know, they just see, oh, this is an entity that we can charge. Disney Plus is making a lot of money in the country. Spotify is making a lot of money in the country, then it should give back to the country. But in taking its share, and you can argue whether it's a fair share or not, but in taking its pound of flesh from the services, I fear that it's a diminution or it, it, we all, everybody on the internet is affected by these types of legislation. And it's not like I'm even pro-business. Like I'm not, I'm not, automatically in favor of like the big tech giants now like Spotify and Google, YouTube, uh, Disney+, Plus, Hulu, all the streaming services. It's just that I wish there were... It's, it, we're, we're a bit more circumspect in how we monkey around with assigning value and trying to recoup value from these transnational actors that do provide value to everybody, not just to Canadians, not just to Americans, but to Filipinos, Malaysians, Indonesians, people in Africa, people in Europe. I mean, literally, it's the World Wide Web, right? Although the World Wide Web only runs on top of the internet, so it's just really a protocol on top of the internet. But, you know, no need to get overly semantic. But And I do fear sometimes when you hear local politicians here na oh, we should uh, regulate Facebook. I mean, <laughs> we're not very good at regulating, guys. I mean, I'm just talking about like the Philippines in general. I, we're, we have very poor metrics in terms of properly regulating things. I think maybe that's where my, my knee-jerk reaction to regulating comes from. The fact that I've lived in the Philippines all my life and have seen very little examples of good regulation like you know regulation that makes sense for both parties involved for the entity being regulated and for the end users so i'm i'm skeptical of my initial position is always a bit skeptical of regulation and well i'm not canadian there's not much i can do about it this probably seems like a very academic topic to a lot of the a lot of our users um, definitely not directly hardware related, 
But it is something to think about in the broader scheme of the internet that we all enjoy and that we've all profited from. Not perhaps in the monetary sense. I mean, not all of us use the internet to sell things, but just in terms of knowledge, of being able to call someone on Viber through the internet, being able to FaceTime with your family whom you're separated from because you're a seaman on a boat and they're here in the Philippines. I mean, the internet is a wonderful thing. And when we have these national laws that maybe indirectly threaten to extinguish that magic, I'm always a bit on the fence and like, mm, and as an internet user, I wish I had my two cents on it. But it's, a, it's also interesting yeah, from a national, transnational perspective where national, you know, specific country laws can affect me even though I am not a citizen of that country. And there have been laws like that. I mean, you have the US FACTA where you have to declare you know, if you have a dollar account or whatever, yung, because of the anti-terrorism stuff in the past, from over the past 20 years or so, there's been a lot of transnational legislation regarding the movement of money. So there are laws in place that are transnational enacted by national actors. But the internet always seems sacrosanct a little bit. You know, the, the realm of geeks. But I guess we passed from that time a long time ago. And now, you know, you have TikTok appearing before the U.S. Congress. U.S. congressmen not particularly adept or technically in general. Okay, I did see one testimony where he was actually a software developer or had, had a extensive knowledge in software, the, this particular congressman. But in general, you know, the a, lo- a lot of the questions were very cringe, not, you know, more suited to grandstanding rather than finding out exactly what is this service doing, how can we make it better for our citizens. And I would imagine the same experience in a lot of countries that are trying to tackle new technologies, but the people doing the tackling are less interested perhaps in... So to extend the metaphor, you tackle somebody because you're trying to gain possession of the ball. And maybe they're interested less in the ball the prize, but more in the tackle, if that makes any sense. Like, you know, let's do some damage to these internet companies that think that they can come in here and tell us how to interact with our citizens or how to run our country or things like that. But neither here nor there, just um, open speculation on my end. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Tech Show But Friendly. Again, if you're listening to this on YouTube, you are one week delayed. You can always catch the latest episodes via Spotify, Apple, or Google, and they drop 6 a.m. every Friday. Thanks for watching. Have a great Friday, guys, or have a great day whenever you're listening to this.